welcome. I am Dr. François Leroy, a history professor at Northern Kentucky University, and we are here today at the Tri-State Warburg Museum located in Batavia, Ohio, uh, to interview Mr. Don Fairbanks, a B-24 tail gunner uh, with the 8th Air Force. Um, a few words maybe about the Tri-State Warburg Museum. It is a museum open to the public um, that is, whose mission is to preserve historical aircraft from World War II. Uh, and so this program is in co combination of, uh, with, between NKU and the Tri-State Warburg Museum. Uh, Mr. Fairbanks, uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for agreeing to talk to us today. Uh, first, could you please maybe uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, where you were born and when? Well, I was born uh, December the 17th, 1923, which is exactly 20 years after the Wright brothers had their first flight, mm -hmm. right to the day. Uh, I was in high school when the war started. Uh, I graduated in May of 1942, and about a week before I graduated, uh, three other classmates and myself went down to the University of Cincinnati and volunteered for, to be pilots in the Air Force. Well, I was a little older than they were, so they weren't accepted right away. I was. Uh, I graduated, and I was about uh, two months later, they called me up to active duty. They sent me to Nashville, Tennessee, and that's where we started our, all of our physical training and so forth. I took uh, some tests down there uh, to find out what area they wanted to put me in. I took a test on armament, which is all the ammunition, guns, and so forth. Took one on uh, communications, radio personnel. I took one on aircraft maintenance. So I had my choice. I took aircraft maintenance. And they sent me to Keesler Field down Mississippi. The school lasted about, as I recall, must have been four or five months. And it was on B-24s, the airplane I ended up later. Uh, goes through everything, replacing things, repairing things, and really knowing the B-24. About graduation time, they came in and asked if any of us wanted to volunteer to be aerial gunners. Hand went up. So I went to Laredo, Texas, and that was about a two or three month program. Uh, we started out firing BB guns, like a machine gun, they shot a stream of BBs at model airplanes on a carrier going the back of the room, and then we moved up to handheld guns on the range, and then we got in flight. Uh, one of the things that, that happened in flight, we started off flying AT-6s like the one in the corner here. We were in the back seat with a handheld machine gun, and we have a seat, but our seat belt was anchored to the floor so we could partially stand up. And there'd be four airplanes in formation like this, and one airplane pulling a target. So one of the planes would peel off, go down, they shoot a target, he'd come up, get back on this end. And we'd go down and shoot a target like that. And this one time, what well, they told us, if uh, the gun malfunctions, throw up our hand, and they'll pull off, and it gives a chance to fix the gun. So I didn't realize we were the last airplane to fly, but we went down there, had a jam, so I threw my hand up. And I'm working on it, look, we're still in the same place, so I threw my hand up again. And the pilot says, you fix the gun, I'll fly the airplane. <laughs> so we fiddled with it and got it and fired at the target. The bullets we used were dipped in a colored paint. And each airplane, each gunner had a different color on the tip of these bullet. When it hit the target, it'd leave a little color on it. If it was red, leave a little red where the bullet went through if it hit the target. A lot of them didn't. <laughs> So then we moved from there, we moved into uh, twin engine airplanes with actual turrets on, like on the B-25 here. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they shipped us up to Boise, Idaho, and we're still all individuals. At Boise, they put us on a combat crew, 10-man crew, and that's where we first met the people we're going to spend the war with. From there, we went to Casper, Wyoming, and that's really the first time we got near a B-24, but the whole crew did training together and bombing, navigation, uh, firing at uh, aircraft. They had a, a thing that they called the airplanes pinball, but they were single engine fighters, uh, Bell P-63, and they had armor plate on the outside, and we fired a bullet, it's called frangible, it's like the lead in your pencil. When it hit, it would shatter, and the 63s had metal on them, a uh, metal uh, armor plate, and each piece of armor plate had a switch on it, so if you hit it, it would record, and right in the nose had a big red light. So if you're hitting it, 
the light would flash, and also it would record the hits on a counter. So that was our air-to-air -air gunnery. And then from there, this took us about a year. I started my training in uh, probably about October of 42. And in uh, December of 43, uh, we got a leave to go home. And then we came back to Topeka, Kansas. And from there, we flew over to England. Uh, they took our crew and split it in half, took five men and, and each airplane. They put us on B-17s and the air traffic, I mean, uh, air transport command flew the B-17s over to England. So we flew over to England on those and then we got to our assigned base. And we didn't know where we were going at all. I mean, you're just, you're just following wherever they point you. And we ended up in an outfit called the Carpet Baggers, which was a, was a super secret outfit. Actually, uh, the OSS started in World War II, mm -hmm. and this was the OSS that we were in. And they told us that super secret, and if you talk to anybody, you're subject to being executed. Now, that gets your attention if you're only 18 years old, 19 years old, you know. I happen to be, uh, let's see, I was what, 19 when I went over, yeah. I was 20 when I came back, so I wasn't even old enough to vote when I came back. But anyhow, uh, we got assigned to the carpetbaggers outfit, and as Bruce said earlier, one of the things that happened, we find out a lot of this stuff after the war, intelligence is really a, a strange, strange thing. If we got shot down on the continent, we were trying to evade to get back. So to do this, they took our picture with a civilian shirt on and a necktie. And the necktie was tied, tied by a person over there, so it would be the European knot rather than the American knot. We didn't know until after the war that if you were shot down, all the Germans had to do is look at your picture. It was in your escape kit. You carried a little kit with food and stuff in it, maps of did get down, had a way to get back. They look at your picture, and they tell exactly what outfit you were in <laughs> because everybody wore the same necktie in that outfit. That's fascinating. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But of course, who knows? Now, the carpetbaggers, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, one, the origins of the name itself, um, and also what were those missions? I mean, so you said you were part of the OSS, the Office of Strategic uh, Services that was started in World War II, uh, the precursor to the CIA. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the work we were doing was started by the British. It was supplying the French with whatever they needed. They take uh, ammunition, handguns, medicine. Uh, one time we dropped a bicycle tire because they couldn't get tires on the continent. And they said the tire was made in England, but it was made the standards used in France with all the markings and everything. I guess they even had the tread worn on it, you know, so that uh, somebody looked at it, they wouldn't expect it was a, suspect it was a new one. But uh, what our outfit was doing was supplying the French and the Belgian underground. We flew at night. Uh, our airplanes carried 12 containers. The containers were about uh, six foot long, about that big in diameter. And we could pack anything anybody wanted into them as long as they didn't exceed about three feet. We had compartments and it, it was really amazing some of the stuff they'd take. Uh, we found out later that one of the things we were dropping was a little handgun, a 45 caliber little handgun. It was made in this country by being stamped instead of being uh, forged or however they make handguns out of. And I think the cost, they figured it was like $3.95 a piece to make these things. And we dropped like 35,000 of them to France and uh, the underground in Belgium. Uh, well, let's see. what. Where can I go from so here? You, uh, so you flew missions for the underground, uh, supplying them with everything they needed. Did you also occasionally... Uh, drop individuals that is that parachuted out of the aircraft? Once in a while we would. The individuals are generally trained to uh, they'd build a say a radio station and they'd be trained where they go to the station blindfolded to get to the equipment they wanted to, to damage. Uh, they had all sorts of and these were volunteers. Uh, most of them were French. Some of them were people who could speak French. But uh, those people really had it rough because if the Germans ever got a hold of them don't know what happens to them. 
So you said you, by, by necessity, you flew also at fairly low altitude. What was kind of the average altitude uh, of your missions? Well, normally, uh, going into France, for example, uh, we'd take off we'd, from the base, we'd climb up. Now, this is done all done at night, or at night. We'd climb up to maybe four or 5,000 feet, which is not very high. We'd fly to the coast, and then we let down to go across the water, down about 100 feet off the water. We had a radar altimeter that would measure our altitude above the water. We did this so that we couldn't be picked up on radar until we got all the way over there. Then we'd pop up to like six, 8,000 feet, cross over the coast, and then we'd drop back, back down to maybe 4,000 feet. Being low like that, we avoided really anybody trying to locate us, whether in airplanes or with the... They had some radar. It wasn't very effective at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way the thing was laid out, each navigator, bombardier, had a target. Each airplane flew individually. We were supposed to be at the target area with like an, a half-hour time frame. And so they would navigate any way they wanted to to use up time and also to avoid all the known ground anti-aircraft areas, avoid cities, things where you might be noticed. But they would go all over. Now, we may have, say, one night maybe two airplanes are going to the very same target. We don't know there's another airplane, but they got a different time to be there. And they go whichever way they want to go, however they want to do to be there in their time frame. Uh, as I, I started to mention, the B-24 carried 12 of these containers. And then they also carried little baskets uh, called panets. They were mm -hmm. woven baskets. And they would put a lot of smaller stuff in there, like medicine and things like this, pack it in uh, straw and mm -hmm. some of the uh, crushable material so it wouldn't damage them. These also had a parachute on them, but the canisters were dropped out of the bomb bay with a parachute on them with a wire that would snap the top off so you shoot it open. These baskets were thrown out the window in the back or out of the hole in the floor where the, the we called them Joes. Mm -hmm. The people would exit if they were being dropped on the continent over there. So part of the load was dropped manually and part of it was dropped out of the bomb bay. And we also carried... Uh, propaganda leaflets that, that were called nickels. That was a code name. Uh, they came in packages, and when you throw it out, the package would break open. And as I recall, there were like 20,000 in a package. And it, we dropped those when we came back over areas trying to make the Germans think that, well, this is why we're out here. We're dropping leaflets, you know. But we wouldn't come back the same way we went out. We would pick a small town, throw out a bundle here, and another town, throw out a bundle over there. So what was your, your, the gravest danger uh, during those missions? Well, it's hard to tell. Uh, sometimes they just went smooth as silk. Sometimes uh, you get in an area where you get shot at. Uh, one night, this is sort of hard for even me to believe, but I was a tail gunner. I'm looking back all the time. We're going this way. One thing that's hard to understand is that there were no lights. I mean, absolutely no lights. So we flew during moonlight. Generally, that period of the month, like two weeks where the moon is more full, you can see fantastically if you have no external light. It's really amazing. And uh, we were over one area where we were supposed to drop our, our load, and there was nobody there. We'd fly over, and they'd give us a, a light signal on the ground using a flashlight. And it had to have a certain code letter in it. But we couldn't even find anybody. So generally, you go back to where you started from and come back in, maybe miss the spot. The second time I came back, somebody shot at us. And I'm a tail gunner. And the, there's a shell. I don't know what caliber it was. It came up like this. And it was rotating like this, the, the, the fluorescent on the rear of it. And it just it went out right there like that. So I don't know really how close he came to hitting us, but it's a lot closer than you think. <laughs> But once in a while, things like that happened. Uh, we had a couple evenings where airplanes would locate us. Uh, we, we never uh, had a bullet hole in us. Uh, one of them shot at us one time. But I guess he probably couldn't see us any better. All our airplanes were painted black, mm -hmm. flat black. When we started, later on, they started painting them shiny black, high gloss black. And they said that the flat black, if the searchlight hit it, you could see it like that. But on the shiny black, it didn't show. Now, why, I don't know, but later on, they were all painted shiny black. So your aircraft did not have any 
markings of any sort. Just had a, an emblem for United States Air Force, had a number on the tail. Now, how many missions altogether did you fly? 30. 30 missions? Is that, was that the, the norm? Well, with it was your 25 outfit? when we started. And uh, I had, we had about, the, well, D-Day was our 21st mission. And we had about 20, 21 missions, 22 missions, something like that. So we're, we're almost done. But when D-Day happened, they upped it to 30. So we thought, well, maybe we're going to have to pull 26, maybe 27. But the moon was full, and before <laughs> they could prorate them, we had our 30 in. Now, uh, what about, you say you flew missions on D-Day? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this? We went this? to Belgium. You went to Belgium on D-Day. What did you do? Do you remember? Same thing. Same we, thing, still dropping? We dropped supplies to the Belgian uh, underground. The reason we didn't go to France is because of where the other airplanes were. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that particular mission, uh, the weather was bad. And we got into Belgium, and they couldn't find what they're looking for, so they came back near the coast got reoriented and, and went back in the second time. The second time went in anyway. We found them and dropped the supplies. And an interesting thing about Belgium, uh, I think it was our 23rd mission. I can't recall right now. But anyhow, we had a reunion in England, and we went down into France, and we were at Lyon. And uh, they had a big uh, luncheon for us. And we were at a table, and the table next to us, a group of French people. One fellow was standing up. I walked over to him and said, do you speak English? Excellent English. Beautiful English. So I introduced, him, uh, introduced myself and I told him I had a, a map I brought over showing where we had dropped in France and I wanted to know if maybe in this group of people he might be able to find somebody we could talk to. He looked and he said, you dropped to me on that mission right there. So we got to know each other very well after that. But he was a, a youngster. I think he was about uh, 18, 17, 18 at that time. And uh, we dropped supplies, and he was in the group that would pick him up and get him out of the drop area. That is fascinating. Yes, amazing, yeah. Um, no, you, you flew 30 missions on the B-24. Um, right. What do you think about the B-24? I know there's a little bit of competition between B-17s and B-24. Well, and their really, there wasn't that much competition. The, the B-24... Well, the B-17, for example, first flew in 1935. The B-24 is 1940. So it had five more years of figuring out how to build airplanes. Uh, it was faster. It could carry a bigger bomb load, and it could go a lot farther. So consequently, it was used in many uh, applications other than just bombing. Uh, you couldn't have used a B-17 doing what we did very well because we had two bomb bays. We carried 12 containers. A B-17 can only carry six and it may not be able to go all the way down to the Pyrenees Mountains and back to England with the navigating we did all over the countryside. It would have been short on fuel. So, you know, they're, they're both different, but uh, that period of time, there were more B-24s built than any other military airplane we had in this country. There were over 19,000 of them. And there were uh, about 12,000 B-17s built. So mm -hmm. there's quite a difference in the two, but... The B-24 was used in all the theaters. The 17 early on, they flew the 17 in the Philippines when the war first started. But it didn't have enough range to do much in the area where the islands are far apart. So the B-24s used over there, and the Navy had a version of the B-24 called a privateer mm -hmm. that they used all the way through the war and well after the war because of its range and speed and so forth and, and the capability of carrying a larger load. Now, did you fly all of your missions with the same crew? Yes. With the same individuals? Yes. Uh, did you remain close to these people? What, like, like Bruce said, really you're closer to them than you are to your family. I guess it's because your neck is stuck out, you know. Uh, but one of the things that is sort of humorous, too, is really I had no fear at all uh, overall because I figured when I went over, I knew I was coming home. Just one of those things I felt. And the thing is, if anything happens, it's just normal. You don't think it's ever going to happen to you. It's going to happen to the other guy. That's just sort of normal thinking, you know. So you don't really dwell on it, except sometimes you do. Uh, one of the fellows we went through training with, he was one of the flight engineers on the other crew, another crew. There were three crews of us. Went through all of our training together. We went into the carpet baggers together. And 
this one fellow was a flight engineer. They were the first crew in our outfit to go down. And they, they got attacked, uh, they got uh, ground fire, hit them. They were low down in the target area. It went into the ground and the only person who was killed was a flight engineer. All the rest of them survived. One of them evaded all the way back to Angle and the others ended up as prisoner. But the fellow that was killed, we were all billeted in the same building. Uh, that night before we went out, he came in and he gave, he gave me his Colt 45 he had, gave another guy his wristwatch and this and that and the other thing. Like he knew he wasn't coming back. He was the only guy that didn't come back. So once in a while you run into stuff like that, it just, you don't know what it is, but it happens. Now, uh, you also spent much time in England during that time. Uh, well, not really. No, no. We got it in England in December, just mm -hmm. before Christmas. And uh, the last mission we had was on the 1st of July. So I was only over there about seven months, eight months. And we, like I say, we flew only when the moon is in the middle of the month, so it's more bright. So like half the month, we didn't fly, which is different than heavy bombardment. They flew almost every day. So what did you do during those those time offs when you know you you could not fly? Well, generally we went to London. It was mm -hmm. just sort of natural. London had the uh, UFO or US USO clubs, mm -hmm. and uh, that's generally where all, everything started. You go there, and, uh, you know what bars to go to, maybe what shows to go to, or whatever. Uh, one of the things that, that was rather odd uh, is an air crew member. All air crew members wore wings. Mm -hmm. And when you go to London, I'm talking about early in 44, from say January to July in that area. Everybody was wearing wings because we're all in the army wearing the same uniform. Mm -hmm. I say everybody was wearing wings. Uh, infantry, everybody. Uh, somebody working the oil room wearing rings. The reason being that wings indicate you got a 50% additional pay <laughs> because you're on flying status. So. Maybe a better class of girls, I don't know. But anyhow, what they did, they came out with a regulation that we had to sew a blue patch on our uniform and then pin the wings on that blue patch. Next time we went to London, you didn't see hardly any wings because, you know, a guy working in the office couldn't put a blue patch on. An infantry guy could put a blue patch on, so they couldn't wear the wings. So it was just really amazing how few people had wings at that point. <laughs> So a lot of people try to pass themselves as oh yeah you know, well flying now fifty percent more pay you have a few more points yeah um, so you said you have you remained been able to see your crew your crewmates uh, over the years a few I did uh, the radio man the uh, dispatcher he was the guy that in the back helped the Joes get out and so forth the navigator I've seen quite a bit he's still living the rest are all dead now. Uh, the bombardier, I saw him. I never saw the pilot again. Uh, I never saw the co-pilot again. And I never saw the flight engineer again. Hmm. Because when we got back, you know, everybody goes home. No, but you've attended several reunions yes. since then? Uh, since I mentioned earlier, our outfit was very secret. We didn't know anything about anything. Hmm. And uh, about maybe at the most 20 years ago, a couple of guys got together and thought, well, let's see if we can start having an annual reunion. So they did, and it kind of grew, but now it's really diminishing. We're having our last one in Washington, D.C. this September because we're down to almost nobody because hmm. age is catching up to everybody. Yeah, so altogether, how many crews were there? Do you, have you been, get, been able to get a sense of the size of this operation? I mean, despite the, the secretive nature of the carpet baggers, how when large of an outfit was it? When we went in the outfit, it was early on. The British were doing it, but we were new. Uh, the United States was new doing this. The pilot had to go on a mission with the British to find out how things went before he could uh, go on our own mission. Um, when we went in the outfit, there were three crews of us went into, there were only two squadrons at that time. Three of us went into one squadron and three other crews went in another squadron. There were only six that were added to the initial nucleus of the outfit that started, which was very small. Uh, 
when the thing ended in uh, late 45, when the war ended, I think totally they had had uh, something like 60 to 80 total B-24s. Uh, now, there was attrition through maintenance and mm -hmm. crashing and getting shot down. So they didn't end up with that many. Uh, we lost about, as I recall, something like a little over a third of them, which is a pretty high attrition rate. So uh, I don't know if any of them ever came back to this country. It was saved. They came back and they sent them a boneyard. Mm -hmm. Now you said that on on your on occasion when you've returned to France that you've met some of the people who've assisted you. Uh, you also indicated that the French have been leaving monuments uh, on sites where B-24s crashed. Uh, have you seen some of those monuments? Yes. Yeah, when, uh, we had this one reunion, we had part of it in England, and then we went to France, as I mentioned, down to mm -hmm. Lyon. And they took us around to different sites where airplanes had crashed, monuments, and and uh, most of the area, just little dinky towns, because all the drops were out away from where the troops were based, the German troops. And some of these, every year, they put flowers. Some do it every month. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so very much here for uh, giving us this chance to, to meet you and to talk to you. We greatly appreciate it, your service and your willingness to be here with us. Um, but this is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much again. Well, and, thank you very uh, much for having me. You're welcome. <laughs>